Hey, BookTube. Welcome back to the History Shelf. I am your host, Peg. I am pleased as punch today to be with you. It's been 11 days, I think, since my last video. And, you know, God, events got away from me and I was pretty busy with work. But when I, it was so funny. I just have to share this with you before I get into the meat and bones of this book haul, which I know you guys are all ready for. Um, when I sat down, I, you know, I was kind of tired, end of the day, that kind of stuff, but I sat down to make this video and I got all excited because I realized I'm about, I'm about to talk to you guys and, um, you know, and put it out there into the universe and hear back from you all. So I got very excited. I missed you guys when life takes over. So I, I think I'm over the hump of some stuff here so that I can come back to you with uh, a more frequent uh, upload schedule. So that is the goal and that is what I'm going to be working toward now. This book haul I have been saving for a while. <laughs> this is the uh, Hamilton book haul, um, another massive haul that I think I'm going to break up into two videos just to keep them shorter. Um, I think they, they topped out at like 20, 20 odd books that I ordered. Uh, and this was right before we moved. So when the package arrived on, you know, I had, I didn't even open it. I just packed it up with all the other boxes and, and we moved in. And then of course, everything else going on, you know, I'm still unpacking my books and trying to arrange them the way that I want, especially down in the front room in the front library parlor. So, but, uh, books are going up. Uh, my collections are starting to come together. So I'm hoping when everything is said and done, I will have pictures, I'll have videos, I will do bookshelf tours, all the things that you guys uh, have said that you want to see. So having said that, uh, let's dive in to my Hamilton book haul. Uh, I guess we'll say for April. <laughs> I'm not sure when I'll do another one. I do have a cart full of stuff already, um, but I'm waiting until I think it's the time is correct for that. Now, the first book. I saw this and I immediately thought of Jason Harrigan. So Jason, across the pond, this one's for you. Um, this is put out by Johns Hopkins University Press. This looked very interesting to me. This is Lure of the Arcane, the Literature of Cult and Conspiracy by Theodore Zielkowski. I have a name that ends in Kowski, so I should have no problem, but it was just the Zeal, Z-I-O-L, Zeal Kowski. There you go. Um, Lore of the Arcane. Look at this cover. It's just so mis... Focus. There you have it. Look at what's going on here. What's going on here? Um, let me read a, a brief description to you. Okay. The conspiracy phenomenon is ancient writes Theodore Zielkowski in the introduction to his latest book. People have believed in conspiracies, presumably as long as there have been groups of at least three people in which one is convinced that the other two are plotting against him or her. In that sense, one might look back as far as Eve and the serpent to find the world's first conspiracy. As we will see, the subject of the conspiracy varies considerably from age to age. Whereas recent generations have tended to find their conspiracies in politics and government, the past often sought its mysteries in religious cults or associations. In ancient Rome, the Senate sought to prohi prohibit the cult of Isis, lest its euphoric excesses undermine public morality and political stability. During the Middle Ages, many rulers feared such powerful and mysterious religious orders as the Knights Templar. Fascination with the arcane is a driving force in this comprehensive survey of con conspiracy fiction. Zielokowski traces the evolution of cults, orders, lodges, secret societies, and conspiracies through various literary manifestations, uh, drama, romance, epic, poetry, opera, novel, uh, down to the thrillers of the 21st century. So that's pretty cool. Um, Let's see, Lure of the Arcane considers Euripides' Bacchae, Andrea's Chemical Wedding, Mozart's The Magic Flute, and, oh, yeah, Jason, Echo's Foucault's Pendulum. Okay, Foucault's Pendulum, among other seminal works. Mimicking the genre's quest-driven narrative arc, the reader searches for the significance of, of conspiracy fiction and is rewarded with the author's cogent reflections in the final chapter. After much investigation, Zielkowski reinforces Umberto Eco's notion that the most powerful secret 
the magnetic center of conspiracy fiction is no secret at all, or a quote, a secret without content, end quote. So yes, I thought of you, Jason, um, and we know that uh, Foucault's Pendulum is one of your um, favorites, and you know everything about that book. So, boom, Lore of the Arcane. Um, let me know what you think of that. And you probably already have it or have read it, Jason, I'm, I'm imagining. All right. Okay, next book. And this, these go all over the map uh, for the most part, but this is mostly, you know, um, the, a book haul that um, is my best kind of book haul history with a little bit of um, a couple of pieces of fiction and a couple of anthologies which are fun but I'll save those for the second video all right so this one we're moving back to um, antebellum America um, this would be Bill Rudenberg's favorite period but this is right up uh, before the Civil War and I think Bill Rutenberg, Bill I think you would like this one this is called the kidnapping club Wall Street, Slavery, and Resistance on the Eve of the Civil War by Jonathan Daniel Wells. And this was put out by Bold Type Books. Um, normally I give you the prices. M maybe some of you appreciate that. Maybe some of you don't. I don't know. I left the paper over there. But anyway, just know that with Hamilton Books, usually the most expensive I pay for anything will be like a $9.95 book. But mostly these are all probably $7.95 or less. Um, all right, so the Kidnapping Club. We often think of slavery as a Southern phenomenon, far removed from the booming cities of the North. But even though slavery had been outlawed in Gotham by the 1830s, black New Yorkers were not safe. Not only was the city built on the backs of slaves, it was essential in keeping slavery and the slave trade alive, which is very true. In my studies and in some of the papers I've written recently, um, yeah, New York does not come off well. I mean they were heavily invested in the South and they did not want to see the South to see, they didn't want to see their business go away. So uh, in the kidnapping club, historian Jonathan Daniel Wells tells the story of the powerful network of judges, lawyers, and police officers who circumvented anti-slavery laws by sanctioning the kidnapping of free and fugitive African Americans. Nick nicknamed the New York kidnapping club. Well, that's really subtle, right? <laughs> The group had the tacit support of institutions from Wall Street to Tammany Hall, whose wealth depended on the southern slave and cotton trade. But a small cohort of abolitionists, including black journalist David Ruggles, organized tirelessly for the rights of black New Yorkers, often risking their lives in the process. Taking readers into the bustling streets and ports of America's great northern metropolis, the Kidnapping Club is a dramatic account of the ties between slavery and capitalism, the deeply corrupt roots of policing, and the strength of black activism. So, um, let's see. Oh, the author's from Detroit. Well, he lives in Detroit, Michigan. Sweet. Native Detroiter here. I'm wearing my, uh, this makes no sense to many of you, and many of you don't care, but I'm wearing, this is the latest gift that Martine has gotten me. This was right before, right after we moved. Got my Super Bowl number nine, Matt Stafford, because he is, for me, will always be a Detroit Lion. Okay, anyway, uh, this book came out. It's really cool. This is like the, it's like a black version of the Rams' uh, jersey. Martine's just so generous, you know. This came out in 2020, so it's a fairly new book, The Kidnapping Club. All right, and then we move into um, some, I think this is one of the more expensive books. I think it was nine ninety five, but it's such a... Um, it's, it, well, speaking of Detroit, and I'm, I'm a Michigan girl, right? So um, that's where I hail from, although I'm a, you know, a Colorado, uh, you know, I've adopted Colorado now as my home state, but I'll always be, have a soft spot for Michigan. But this looks at Native Americans in and around the Great Lakes. This is Masters of Empire, Great Lakes Indians, and the Making of America by Michael A. McDonald. Um, this is put out by Hill and Wang. Hill and Wang. Um, in Masters of Empire, the historian Michael A. McDonnell reveals the vital role played by the native peoples of the Great Lakes in the history of North America. Uh, I've always been interested in the Native American history ever since I was a young girl, and I really got into uh, 
the old West, the American West, and I had the whole leather bound, faux leather bound time life series of the old west and i i think my my volumes on the american indians um, or native americans were my favorite um i was just fascinated and i still am um though less well known than the iroquois or sioux the oh yes the anish the anishinaabeg uh, who lived across lakes michigan and huron were equally influential interesting side note in some fiction that i've been reading um I was actually introduced to the Anishinaabeg through a mystery series, a detective series, um, which I have mentioned on this channel by um, uh, William Kent Kruger. Um, and it's about a half Anishinaabeg, half Irish uh, cop detective in, I think it's Minnesota, up in the wilds there. And uh, I, I read his prequel, and I was introduced to the series through his prequel that is that just came out in hardcover about last year, and I wrote a review for it for um, Book Browse, and um, fell in love with it, fell in love with the character, the settings, everything, and I was really intrigued by the Anishinaabeg. So when I saw this book and they mentioned them, I was like, oh my gosh, what a perfect tie-in. So anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. Um, okay, so Masters of Empire charts the story of one group um, of the Anishinaabeg, the Odawa who settled at the straits between those two lakes, uh, Michigan and Huron, a hub for trade and diplomacy throughout the vast country west of Montreal, known as the, okay, my French is horrible. It's horrible. Pays de Dinhout. The Pays de Dinhout. Someone help me, French speakers. Pays Dinhout. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Highlighting the long-standing rivalries and relationships among the great Indian nations of North America, McDonald shows how Europeans often played only a minor role in this history and reminds us that it was native peoples who possessed intricate and far-reaching networks of commerce and kinship, of which the French and British knew little. As empire encroached upon their domain, the Anishinaabeg uh, were often the ones doing the exploiting. Uh, by dictating terms at trading posts and frontier forts, they played a crucial part in the making of early America. Though uh, through vivid de depictions, all from a native perspective of early skirmishes, the French and Indian War, and the American Revolution, Masters of Empire overturns our assumptions about colonial America by calling attention to the Great Lakes as a crucible of culture and conflict. I love that. Uh, McDonald reimagines the landscape of American history. Um, I'm so excited. Um, this is going to be a fantastic read. And it's really going to fill in my knowledge of uh, that tribe and that area. So Masters of Empire. I think this one was uh, 995 uh, on Hamilton Book. This one and maybe another one, but it maybe it could have been 795. But either way, I think it's well worth it. And these are like brand new books, so... You can't beat it. Okay, then we switched it up to a slim volume. This goes to a, a pen and sword military history volume. Uh, sometimes they offer on Hamilton Book, and for the ones that I don't have, I often pick, try to pick up the ones I'm missing in my collection. And this is their Cold War series of books, and it covers a range of topics of the Cold War era from 1945 to 1991. And this is Red China. Mao crushes um, Chang's Kuomintang. 1949 by Jerry Van Tonder. They're slim little volumes put out by Pen and Sword, but they cover something, you know, um, a certain event uh, and a very high level detail. It says here, when the world held its breath, China, 1949, two fast empire, sorry, two vast armies prepare for a final showdown that will decide Asia's future. One is led by Mao Zedong, determined to emerge victorious, and his military strategists, uh, strategists Zhao and Lai and Zhu Dei. Hardened by years of guerrilla warfare, armed and trained by the Soviets, the People's Liberation Army is poised to strike from its Manchurian stronghold. Um, the Soviet victory against the Japanese Kwantung Army in 1945, having allowed Mao's communists to rearm and prepare for the coming civil war. Opposing them are the teetering divisions of the Kuomintang, or the KMT. For two decades, 
Chiang Kai-shek's regime had sought to fashion China into a modern state, but years spent battling warlords and enduring Japan's brutal conquest of their homeland has left the KMT weak, corrupt, and divided. Millions of Chinese perished during the crucible of the Sino-Japanese War and the grueling years of the Second World War, but these figures will pale into insignificance as China's rebirth as a communist dictatorship will unleash the biggest mass murderer in the history of the world. Very true. Mao was by far the worst when it came to sheer numbers. Uh, so anyway, so a little volume there to add to. I have a, a couple of others in this series, this Cold War 1945-1991 series. And uh, that's something I'm still working on in this room. I'm still trying to organize my shelves into a semblance of topic-related stuff. Um, God, I've just been so busy. <laughs> It's been so busy, but it's all good. Um, okay, now we jump to World War I, France. And this is a neat little volume I picked up, I think, for like 5 or six ninety-five. This is put out by Yale University Press. I think, when did this come out? I hadn't seen it, but it's a small little book. It's It's got, uh, it's not a standard size book. A little bit smaller. Uh, this came out in 2016, and it was translated from... I'm um, guessing the French. Uh, yeah. All right, so we got August 1914, France, the Great War in a Month that Changed the World Forever, translated by, uh, that's by, sorry, Bruno Cabanes, or Cabanes, tra translated by Stephanie O'Hara. All right, on August 1st, 1914, war erupted into, into the lives of millions of families across France. Most people thought the conflict would last just a few weeks. Yet before the month was out, 27,000 French soldiers died on the single day of August 22nd alone, the worst catastrophe in French military history. Refugees streamed into France as the German army advanced, spreading rumors that intensified the ordeal of war. Citizens of enemy countries who were living in France were viciously scapegoated. Drawing from diaries, personal correspondence, police reports, and government archives, Bruno Cabanes offers an in-depth, narrative-driven study of the first weeks of World War I in France, told from the perspective of ordinary women and men caught in the flood of mobilization. This revealing book deepens our understanding of the tra traumatic impact of war on soldiers and civilians alike. So as you can see, it's a small little volume. So I, I just love that photograph. So evocative. I had been toying with the the last few shopping trips. I had seen it, and I I just I hadn't pulled the trigger on it. And I decided, you know, why am I? Sorry about that. The light goes in, the light goes out. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I've been you know trying to make up my mind whether to get it or not. But I'm glad I finally have it. Okay. Oh. Now we're moving over to like um, uh, historical, socio, philosophical essay, nonfiction. Well, anyway, you know that I enjoy the work of Hannah Arendt and uh, several of her works and books about her. Um, oh gosh, and where are they? Because I have a biography on her I want to buddy read with. Stephanie at some point. I haven't forgotten Stephanie. Um, but this is Arendt's Judgment, Freedom, Responsibility, Citizenship by Jonathan Peter Schwartz. This was put out by Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania Press. Okay. Yep. University of, Pen University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, I think this one was a $10 book, but it's in perfect condition. Brand, brand new, came out in 2016. So what is this about? I'll tell you. Uh, in Arendt's judgment, Jonathan Peter Schwartz explores the nature okay, of human judgment, the subject of the planned third volume of Hannah Arendt's The Life of the Mind, which was left unwritten at the time of her death arguing that previous interpretations of Arendt failed to fully appreciate the central place of judgment in her thought. Schwartz contends that understanding Arendt's ideas requires not only interpreting her published work, but also reconstructing her thinking from a broader range of sources, including her various essays, lecture course notes, unpublished material, and correspondence. 
when these sources are taken into account, it becomes clear that for Arendt, political judgment was the answer to the question of how human freedom could be realized in the modern world. This new approach to understanding Arendt leads to what Schwartz argues are original insights Arendt can teach us about the nature of politics beyond sovereignty and the role of human agency in history. Above all, her novel understanding of the authentic nature and purpose of political philosophy is finally revealed. Um, Schwartz claims that in her theory of political judgment, Arendt presented a vision of political philosophy that is improved and deepened by the contributions of ordinary active citizens. Along with challenging previous interpretations, Arendt's judgment provides a roadmap to her published and unpublished work for scholars and students. So I was really, I had never heard of this book, so I was pretty tickled to find it. Um, yeah, good stuff. If you're a Hannah Arendt fan, you might want to check this one out. Ten bucks. All right. Oh, now. I got this one for the author alone. I'll just, let me just preface this by saying I have read several biographies on John Brown, and I'm kind of John Browned out. However, I had never read, this is a classic that obviously, this is one I just had never gotten to, but it's supposed to be a classic. Um, and this is Stephen B. Oates's To Purge This Land with Blood, a biography of John Brown. Stephen B. Oates is a very, uh, fairly prolific Civil War historian, or, uh, you know, um, yeah, he's, he's written several books on that era. Um, Clara Barton, uh, Lincoln, goes a little bit beyond the Civil War. He's written about Martin Luther King Jr. Um, yeah, but I, I've, I know Stephen B. Oates, not, not personally, but I mean, <laughs> I know his work. And uh, when I saw this, I was like, I haven't read his take on John Brown. So at this point, I've read so many different biographies on John Brown that I feel like I can qual qualitatively <laughs> analyze which one is the best. Um, but yeah, so this one came out from Mass the University of Massachusetts Press. And I didn't know how long this one would be around on the, the bargain table at Hamilton Books, so I thought I'd better pick it up uh, before it's gone because this originally came out in 1970. So there you have it. So nice, clean little paperback here. So I thought I'd pick it up. We're at 22 minutes. We're doing pretty good. Well, we're, now we're going to go back to um, Native American history, which I was so excited for. I think this one, this is a slim volume. Oh, another one that came from... University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, yep. And this kind of tackles another little uh, niche interest of mine, which is, you know, I, I've always been intrigued by the lost colony of Roanoke, right? Um, I just I just eat it up. I love books about it. You know, the whole Croatone <laughs> thing carved in the tree, all that kind of stuff. And in fact, I wrote a paper in one of my classes back when I was in school on Roanoke. So I did a lot of, I did a kind of a deep dive in researching it and it really got me down into the guts of the stories and it was just fascinating. But so I saw this and very intrigued. This is The Head in Edward Nugent's Hand, Roanoke's Forgotten Indians by Michael Leroy Oberg, University of Pennsylvania Press. Yeah, it's a little slim little paperback volume here. Roanoke is part of the lore of early America, the colony that disappeared. Many Americans know of Sir Walter Raleigh's ill-fated expedition, but few know about the Algonquin peoples who were the island's inhabitants. This book examines Raleigh's plan to create an English empire in the New World, but also the attempts of native peoples to make sense of the newcomers who threatened to transform their world in frightening ways. Beginning his narrative well before Raleigh's arrival, Oberg looks closely at the Indians who first encountered the colonists. The English intruded into a well-established Native American world at Roanoke, led by Wingina, the Wiroance, or leader, of the Algonquin peoples on the island. Oberg also pays close attention to how the Wiroance and his people understood the arrival of the English. We watch as Wingina's brother, First boards Raleigh's ship, and we listen in as when Gina receives 
the report of its arrival. Driving the narrative is the leader's ultimate fate. When Gina is decapitated by one of Raleigh's men in the summer of 1586. Oh, boy. Okay, well, there's no happy ending there. It's a slim volume. It's about 160 pages, but um, it's, it's another people that I've been really intrigued by. Um, or, the, or the Native Americans that were, uh, you know, first detailed along this area here. You know, Pamlico Sound. You have the Whippamock, Choanock, Sucatan, and the Roanoke. So, very, very fascinating. And, um, yeah, good stuff. This is great. So, I think this one might have been the most expensive one. 995 but well worth it. Oh, and then I've been waiting for this book. I've been trying, I tried to get a review copy when it first came out. I wasn't as successful, but not for a lack of trying. Um, but it finally made it to Hamilton book, which I'm very happy about. And uh, this is, now we're moving to Italy. You love how I just take you all around. It's like a little teleporter, just take you everywhere, any era, different areas of the world. So now we're going to Italy, um, early 20th century. Who could I be talking about, you say? I've been wanting this for a while. This is Mussolini's War. Fascist Italy from Triumph to Collapse, 1936 to 1943 by John Gooch. This was put out by Pegasus Books. This came out a couple years ago, I think. Well, maybe not even. I, I really tried hard to get this one. Ah, this came out in 2020. So December of 2020. Um, all right, we're at 26 minutes. I think I'm, I am going to break these up into two videos. I've got another stack to go through so uh, I have one more book after this and then we'll head over into part two so please do stay tuned and tune in for part two all right while staying closely aligned with Hitler Mussolini remained carefully neutral until the summer of 1940 at that moment with the wholly unexpected and sudden collapse of the French and British armies Mussolini declared war on the allies in the hope of making territorial gains in southern France and Africa this decision proved a horrifying miscalculation, dooming Italy to its own prolonged and unwinnable war, immense casualties, and an Allied invasion in 1943 that ushered in a terrible new era for the country. John Gooch, John, John Gooch's new history is the definitive account of Italy's war experience, beginning with the invasion of Abyssinia and ending with Mussolini's arrest. Gooch brilliantly portrays the nightmare of a country with too small an industrial sector too incompetent a leadership and too many fronts in which to fight. Everywhere, whether in the USSR, the Western Desert, or the Balkans, Italian troops found themselves against either better equipped or more motivated enemies. The result was a war entirely at odds with the dreams of pre-war Italian planners, a series of desperate impro improvisations against an allied force who could draw on global resources and against whom Italy proved helpless. Uh, well blurbed. Um, I really trust these blurbs. Uh, R.J.B. Bosworth is a, a well-known authority on Mussolini and the period uh, in Italy when Mussolini was in power. I have several of his books, or at least a couple of his, and um, it's good stuff, and I really trust his judgment. So he has blurbed this book. Then you got uh, Hugh Strachan, who wrote the you know magister magisterial history of World War I, uh, has also blurbed this, and uh, a couple of other folks I haven't heard of. But either way, um, this is going to be great. I've been kind of growing my Italian history library, as, or, you know, that my shelf, as it were, of, like, uh, titles on Italian history. I'm going to try to group these, these eras together on my shelves if I can. It's going to take a lot of work. I've got a lot of books mixed in. I'm looking in the background from the camera already. I've got Crusades mixed in with... The Battle of the Somme, I have, <laughs> I've got um, World War II memoirs mixed in with Tudors, I've got Napoleon mixed in with, oh my goodness, Ayn Rand, don't even ask me how this happens, <laughs> I've got to make sense of this library, so I've got a nice little, uh, I think a two week period where I have no deadlines and I am going to be working on building my library into some sense. But 
I wanted to share this with you. I was excited because I finally came to my favorite bargain book outlet, and uh, it's going to be a great read when I can get to it. Now, for something completely different, um, I have followed this author, writer, speaker. Um, you know, she's controversial, controversial, I guess, in some areas, but I don't know why. She's a wonderful advocate of women's rights um, internationally, and um, I understand why she would be in some sectors uh, controversial, but I agree. <laughs> I, I agree with her stance on, you know, women's rights, period. And uh, I just want to support her work. And I, I've, I have a couple of her other books. Um, and this is Ion Her CLE. And this is her latest book, Pray, Immigration, Islam, and the Erosion of Women's Rights. So this came out, I think, a year ago. This is put out by Harper. So when I saw it was already on the bargain book outlet, I was like, wow. And, you know, it goes to show you that I don't, this just came out last year. This is a brand new book. Um, but I've enjoyed her other books. Um, they're very sobering. Um, and as a woman, very upsetting in many ways. So I, I wanted to read what she's thinking now, what she's seeing, and what she's reporting on here. So let's let's get after it here. In Prey, Ayan Hirsi Ali, the best-selling author of Infidel, presents startling statistics, criminal cases, and personal testimony. Among these facts, in 2014, sexual violence in Western Europe surged following a period of stability. In 2018, in Germany, quote, offenses against sexual self-determination, end quote, rose 36% from their 2014 rate. Nearly two-fifths of the suspects were non-German. In Austria in 2017, asylum seekers were suspects in 11% of all reported rapes and sexual harassment cases, despite making up less than 1% of the total population. This, violent, this violence isn't a fig, figment of alt-right propaganda, Hersi Ali insists, even if neo-Nazis exaggerate it. Correct. It's a real problem that Europe and the world cannot continue to ignore. She explains why so many young Muslim men who arrive in Europe engage in sexual harassment and violence, tracing the roots of sexual violence in the Muslim world from institutionalized polygamy to the lack of legal and religious protections for women. A refugee herself, Hirsi Ali is not against immigration. As a child in Somalia, she suffered female genital mutilation. As a young girl in Saudi Arabia, she was made to feel acutely aware of her own vulnerability. Immigration, she argues, requires integration and assimilation. She wants Europeans to reform their broken system and for Americans to learn from European mistakes. If this doesn't happen, the calls to exclude new Muslim migrants from Western countries will only grow louder. Deeply researched and featuring fresh and often shocking revelations, Prey uncovers a sexual assault and harassment crisis in Europe that is turning the clock on women's rights much further back than the Me Too movement is advancing it. So, uh, an interesting corrective to that. Um, and uh, she's a fantastic writer. Um, I think she speaks like three or four languages. And uh, I, I follow her. I, I listen to her. I try to check her out when she does interviews and things like that. But um, I was really happy to see that I could get a, a copy of Prey. Um, so quickly. So that is my first portion of my book haul um, from Hamilton Books. So let me get my mouse here. All right, guys. So uh, I have a part two coming right up right behind me. So just uh, click on that. You'll find it right after this one. So we'll see you back here soon. Book two. Bye.